Whether you are here in Stuart 6 or joining us online, we are deeply grateful that you are among us. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker this year, Dr. Kate Bowler. In addition to being a self-described incurable optimist, she is an associate professor of the history of Christianity in North America at Duke Divinity School. She's also a proud Canadian who completed her undergraduate degree at McAllister College, a master of religion. <laughs> McAllister in the house. She also received her Master of Religion at Yale Divinity School. We'll forgive you that. <laughs> Pray for her. And a PhD at Duke University. Kate, it is never too late to become a Princeton Seminary alum. We all are keeping hope alive. Dr. Bowler is also the author of Blessed, a history of the American prosperity gospel, which Dr. Heath Carter says he's memorized. <laughs> that book has received widespread attention and academic praise as the first history of the movement based on divine promises of health, wealth, and happiness. She wrote the New York Times best-selling memoir, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. <laughs> After being unexpectedly diagnosed with stage four cancer at age 35. Kate, seven years after that diagnosis, We are profoundly grateful you're here. Thank you. Dr. Bowler has since staged a national conversation around why it, can be, why it can feel so difficult to speak frankly about suffering through her popular podcast, Everything Happens. <laughs> if you haven't tuned in, you should. Her book, The Preacher's Wife, the precarious power of evangelical women celebrities follows the rise of celebrity Christian women in American evangelicalism. She has appeared on NPR, The Today Show, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Time Magazine, and now Princeton <laughs> Theological Seminary. <laughs> Saving the best for last. Her latest book, No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear, grapples with her diagnosis, her ambition, and her faith as she tries to come to terms with limitations in a culture that says anything is possible. She lives in Princeton, New Jersey in our dreams. <laughs> Just mine? Okay. And Durham, North Carolina, in reality. She's Tobin's wife, she's Zach's mom, and she's a Shiro for many of us in this room. With gratitude to the Edwin H. Ryan Alumni Lectureship, for sponsoring her keynote, please help me welcome Dr. Kate Bowler to Princeton Center. Oh my word! I I feel I feel like we just got married. You know, like we've we've said our vows. And uh, could I? Uh, I am so grateful we get to be here together. I am so honored that we can feel 
the joy of each other's actual presence, and I'd love to acknowledge straight off why I'm here, and you're here, and why we're here like this. You deserve a do-over, ministerially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, for all that you have endured over the last few years. And even though we Christians cringe at the word deserve, I'm going to say it again. You deserve a do-over, a repeat, a reboot, a let's try that again. You deserve an award for getting here and attempting to have fun. But even more than that, you deserve a this situation felt impossible, uh, I lost too much, and a shocking amount of, seriously, what does ministry even mean in this context? <laughs> but most of all, you need a beautiful day in a place that has defined such an important part of your theological formation. And you need a minute surrounded not only by friends, but by witnesses who know the cost of ministry right now. They saw it. They felt it. It was real. Life offers us so few chances to return to places that matter to us, to have that full circle moment. So I want to begin with a thank you. Thank you, Princeton, for knowing the wisdom of moments like these. Um, and hey, is my sound fine? Do I sound no. quiet? No. No. No, he says. It needs to be louder. I like your honesty. Are we, should I just yell more? Just a lot of imperative. Yeah? Does it feel? Because I keep feeling like I'm leaning towards it in an intimate NPR moment where you can hear the sound of my saliva. That's how you know it's quality programming. You can hear them swallow. Okay, I feel... There is always a temptation after a season like this, after a weekend, a pandemic, a big moment, a moment where we need to and want to define what has happened. And I am here with a very unusual specialty as a historian to tell you that you will, in retrospect, want to bright side the crap out of all of this. <laughs> I study the cultural scripts that we are given about moments like this, moments where we need or want to redefine what has happened. I also understand disappointment. I was rejected from this PhD program in my <laughs> mid-20s. <laughs> And I have always wanted to bring it up in a speech, so thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, I love you. But I did think that maybe for our time together, it might be nice to talk about the very, very tempting ways people have to explain moments like this. And then maybe I could be a little bit bossy about what I prefer instead. Does that sound all right? OK. So first, you know this. People will want to tell you that all of your losses were secretly gains. Do you remember this? In the first flushes of the pandemic, the American middle class seemed to experience sort of a surge of collective resolve. They weren't trapped at home in the midst of world remaking earth plague. They were cutting down on their commute time. They were spending more quality time with loved ones and picking up old hobbies. There were silver linings everywhere. Sourdough starters. <laughs> the shocking benefits of suburban chicken coops, vegetable gardens, popping up all over social media to show us the benefits of modern homesteading. Carpe diem. People got a Peloton. <laughs> there were bucket list items to check off right there at home. You don't need to use your church and grounds when you could simply be using your own mind in your basement on Zoom. It's called the Universal Church. It's available to you in your basement universally. But please use that blurry filter. We're not really going to want to see that much. Miss going to the gym. 
miss the freedom and fun with friends and activities? Well, what about the free weights you found in the garage? <laughs> what about those? Count your blessings, be more present. Then you always wanted to spend more time with your family. <laughs> this is the very difficult to describe truth of living right now at the long end of long years of hemorrhaging pandemic losses. Wanting to reach for the hope, especially on a beautiful day like today, that things do not always have to be as they've been. And frankly, we are idealists. You chose theological education, you little do-gooders. <laughs> you could have been somewhere out there making money, but no, <laughs> boo for you. You chose a life of meaning and service. Here we are. We want to believe that change is possible, that we could be kinder than we've been, more empathetic than we were raised to be, more aware of policies that bring justice to our neighbors, and now, while we're on the subject of neighbors, less pissy about our actual neighbors. <laughs> we are hoping, perhaps as survivors and people enduring pain and caregivers and as ministry professionals and do-gooders of all kinds wanting to outgrow our worst selves that each passing year might bring not just any old change but transformation. We may feel as the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca felt that quote this place that has been granted to us rushes by so speedily and so swiftly that all save a very few find life at the end, just when we are getting ready to live. But trying feels harder than it did before. And that must be hard for Americans, she said respectfully as Canadian, thank you for bringing that up, <laughs> because Americans are famous for knowing how to try. So that's sort of what I hoped we could talk about for a minute, is three truths we need to live like this, trying to try. How we might, in this culture, because you're reformed, you're not tempted by narratives of perfectibility, but I'm gonna talk you into the fact that you are. How we might <laughs> imagine ourselves as perfectible. Uh, how a strain of metaphysical mind power convinced many people to ramrod their circumstances into some kind of perfection through positivity, and how we might make a little bit room, more room in our lives for the reality of our finitude, our humanity. Okay, so let me talk you in. I love, ref oh, I love our Princeton crowd. I'm gonna talk you in to the Perfectibility Project, okay? <laughs> American culture has popular theories about how to build a perfect life, right? From Puritans of New England and their advice books to Benjamin Franklin's advice charts to the explosion of late 19th century new thought movements and the 20th century's explosion of self-help books to our present day guides to manifesting your wishes. Americans have been avid consumers about guidance to a better version of themselves. Do I need to talk you into doing a fun game called let's go to Target and look at the cheap paperbacks? Do you do this also? <laughs> is this, I feel, is this gonna be all intuitive or, are we just, or do I have to make the argument through the New York Times? Which one? Because I'll do it, Target, done. Thank you, thank you. All right, so from the sort of secrets of the Stoics, Aztecs, Zen masters, Abraham Lincoln, Attila the Hun, all their secrets have been revealed. You can think and grow rich, you can stop apologizing, you can lose weight, find your soulmate, run with wolves. In short, you can have it all if you learn how to conquer your limits. There is infinity lurking at the bottom of your inbox or in the stack of self-help titles on your bedside table. And it will taunt you as you grip your steering wheel in traffic, attempting your new breathing practice. <laughs> or in the pre-dawn minutes when you could be working out. And if you check your social media feed, whether you are a Facebook person, you are deeply disappointed by Instagram, etc., the debate has been settled. Yes, you can be perfect. In fact, other people are already living beautiful, joyful, effortlessly perfect lives. And it's embarrassing that we haven't joined their ranks already. It's very simple. Use this moisturizer, lose the extra pounds. Did you really give 10% of your income to charity this year? Your grandma needs a card. I'm not sure you've forgiven your father. 
What about the credit card debt? Wait, what about that degree? Oh, you've got that one settled. Oh, your partner thinks you're selfish. And I know at this very moment, you just ask your friends or your grandkids, at this moment, there's a 99% chance that your photos have not been synced with the cloud. <laughs> and you are at risk of losing them forever. Or then what about the real stuff, right? We get sick, we get tired, our friends' problems, our partners' problems eat us alive. We cheat, or they do. We can't seem to find the person we want to be with or stay that person ourselves. The role that we're in is a dead end. Someone we love is losing their memory and is miserable to care for. We have this feeling like we want to be more, happier, healthier, wealthier, more grounded, more present, but we're not. That feeling, that awful feeling in the pit of our stomachs is what I love to call the perfectibility project. Try harder, do better, someone else is already at the finish line. We, as a society, have drunk too deeply from the wells of our modern self-help culture. We've taken a very precious truth about faith, which is that we can grow closer to God and in the meantime, become more fully human. And we've transformed it into a capitalistic imperative. That everything is possible if you attend this seminar, or everyone has a cousin who's recently got into essential oils. <laughs> or if you're breezing through an airport, you'll find the latest time management strategy. This form of perfectionism argues that we can be capable of anything at the right emotional, mental, physical price. And admitting to anything else is just low self-esteem. We're fine. No, not even that. We are perfect just as we are. Look within. We don't need to be saved at all. Everything we need is already inside of us. So, which one is it, right? You already know this. Are we terrible, perfectible, already perfect? I don't imagine that in roughly 25 minutes, we will settle centuries of Christian debate about precisely how good we are, except that I believe that we are finding a beautiful place between two poles, everything and nothing. And that perfection is impossible, but transformation isn't. That we still believe that we can change a bit if we really want to. And we feel the truth of this every time we wake up in the morning from all the choices we make. We are reaching to find enough momentum to sustain a life that is never perfect, but good enough. Now, let me tell you what a wild and hilarious thing it would be if in our culture, you started saying this kind of thing at parties. <laughs> if you were going to admit that you were not in the hip cultural parlance going to live your best life now. <laughs> best life now. That little phrase, it was coined at the dawn of the 21st century to describe the satisfaction of mastering your life. Televangelist Joel Osteen, pastor of America's largest church, coined the phrase in 2004. And ever since, it has been the ubiquitous phrase from Oprah to diet gurus to Hallmark movie starlets <laughs> as the gold standard. How did you know you were truly living? You were living your best life now, and you could see the fullness of this spilling out from your Instagram or social media or, God forbid, TikTok. <laughs> and this is basically, if you ever have sort of theologically wrestled with the purpose of a Christmas card, like, <laughs> we know this, right? We know this performative work. <laughs> Landed my dream job, hashtag blessed. <laughs> Surfing in New Zealand again, does it ever get old? <laughs> or the ultimate relationship prosperity gospel, happy anniversary, honey. You're my best friend, my soulmate, my everything. And according to every reality show I've ever watched, it is the only correct response if you run into an ex-boyfriend and they say, but how are you? I'm living my best life now, Matthew. <laughs> no explanation required. Also, Matthew really is someone who broke up with me once, and just fitting his name into lectures brings me so much joy. 
I cannot tell you. But the great triumph of the best life now paradigm in our culture is that it neatly summarizes the promises of an entire American wellness industry. That everything is possible if you only believe. And you can find it everywhere from megachurches, which is my academic specialty, to Burning Man, which I hope is no one's, <laughs> uh, Peloton to Goop, or if you ever, please don't try, a local hot yoga studio. But right now at this very moment, a woman really, really, really wants to explain manifesting to you. But good vibes right now are big business. Every year, roughly $12 billion are pumped into the wellness industry, defined by the theory that we can be perfected, that we can organize ourselves, heal ourselves, budget ourselves, eat ourselves whole. And it has now become the dominant way that we think about when we talk about what we are capable of inside of a week, a month, a year, a life. Can we conquer this project called the self? Now, it's become such a dominant American genre that by 1984, the New York Times basically gave up on the bestseller list as a list and was just like, forget it. We'll just start self-help, comma, recipes, comma, miscellaneous. And that entire list is where they tried to pour the juggernaut of self-help titles. And what was at first just meant to be um, you know, every good habit or self-improvement philosophy became a cheap paperback with a fully orbed commercial empire. Uh, for my own amusement, I made a spreadsheet of what everybody read during the pandemic. And I think we know where this anecdote is going. I thought, wouldn't now, in a giant um, encounter, mass encounter with death, uh, with, you know, one million gone, now might be a nice time to revisit the story of everything is possible if you will only believe. So I did what I do, which is I catalog and squirrel away every single book in fact. Um, and it turns out, of course, as you know, that uh, sales of the mind over everything, mental mastery, only skyrocketed during times of incredible constriction and limitation. So over the last few years, these are the cheap paperbacks that will always invariably find their way into every church library, only because people don't throw them out. You can throw books out, you know. It's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful exercise. The recycling can accept heresy. They really can. They really can. No. But modernity right now is in a kind of fever dream about unlimited choice, that we can learn to be young forever, successful forever, agents of our own perfectibility. And then people fall in love with Tony Robbins and Eckhart Tolle and Joyce Meyer and Rachel Hollis. Women learned that they could better themselves by squeezing themselves into Kim Kardashian waist trainers or measured by Weight Watchers points or enhanced by the right shade of Mary Kay. Men would have to save like Dave Ramsey, flip a tire or two at a local CrossFit <laughs> or master the habits of highly effective people but this is the American admiration for capitalists and bootstrappers that has made every single person, hence the Christmas card obsession, into their own televangelist of good, better, best. So if you have ever, like me, felt like a failure for not being able to fix, master, conquer this project called the self and a life, then welcome. Welcome to the weight, the burden of the perfectibility project. Because by now, everyone in this room, life, pandemic, etc., has become an expert in befores and afters. There was a time before, remember when life buzzed but it didn't blur? Breakfast was consumed and there's always some kind of errand across town. And then there's always an after, after the diagnosis, after it came back again, after friendships or partners changed, after jobs changed, after people disappointed you, after the pandemic, and after and after and after. And this is the people in the world and the ministry we have is in finding messages of hope and love for a world after. For me, that moment came uh, when I was 35 
and a physician's assistant called me at work to tell me that I had stage four cancer and that I'd have to uh, walk to the hospital because it was on campus to just leave my stuff and walk to the hospital right away. And it was the feeling, I'll never forget, that there was a life that I loved and that it was over. There is a moment in our lives where we think, I had a good run there for a minute, right? <laughs> and then so often then, we are placed back to where we hoped we would never go before, to the place where we almost had the life where we wanted. And then there is the life we have, the life like this. Which brings me to the second thing I um, have spent a great deal of time enjoying and studying, which is the burden of positivity in a moment like that. If, um, if you would have met me post-cancer, you would have assumed that, uh, like I do love the phrase incurable optimist, mostly because I've been incurable from cancer for such a long time, <laughs> which I enjoy um, as a category. So often what we have is a cultural story about optimism in which we imagine that optimism is the solution to the life after, that this will be what gives us undeniable bounce. And we all know people like that, people where every time they're hit, sort of like human whack-a-mole, they just get back up. And we love our tiggers. And if you had seen me a couple years ago, you would have assumed that I was absolutely one of them. My cancer strategy was aggressive cheerfulness. I was going to I was going to be optimistic like it was a full-time job. I acted like I had signed a waiver at some point for a reality program. I did not realize I was starring in about a woman who gets cancer and is really excited about it. <laughs> but the positive thinking I want to talk to you about is different than that form of optimism and hope. The roots of our culture's obsession with positivity began a little over 100 years ago from a tangled web of intellectuals and conferences in this movement called New Thought. And that is only important because as a historian, I love to begin sentences with, it was the late 19th century. But it was the late 19th century. <laughs> and this was the beginning of America's obsession with the idea that our, cult, that our minds contained a hidden potentiality. It was a moment in which all kinds of inventions from electric light to uh, discoveries in the nascent field of psychology uh, are, are allowing people to experiment with things like the placebo effect, um, hypnosis, suggestibility. And suddenly, all kinds of religious forms began to consolidate around the idea that maybe our minds are more powerful than we imagined. People start coming up with more and more spiritual language for invisible mental causality. So you, as you can imagine, because Christians think Christianly, it quickly became incorporated into a Christian framework. So um, if this were Sunday school, this is a great room for it. If they imagine the power of um, the, the power of words then to bring things into being, they might imagine the Genesis story as something like, and God said, let there be light, and there is light. But the mechanism is God's speech. And so Christians began to speak more and more about the mental power of each believer to wield the power of God and bring things into reality. And this started going by a zillion different names. It's kind of like a little miasma of thought. So it might be called mind power, mental magic, affirmations, kids these days manifesting, or in the 1950s and 60s, most famously by Norman Vincent Peale's positive thinking. But in this model, words and thoughts are like boomerangs. They, what good ones go out, and whatever goes out then comes back to you. So conversely, if you say something negative, negative things that go out will then come back to you. Reason why I find this genuinely so important to tell you as ministry professionals is that this is most people's mental infrastructure of what happens if they accidentally say something honest. And just give it a go. Feel the weight of the room if you say something that is culturally deemed negative and just let it sit. 
And you're all practiced at this, so you know the act of keeping space for people, but hear it sort of in the tinniness of people's voice, where you say, let's say, I have a, like, a, I'll tell you a real thing. I have a scan coming up, and it's absolutely terrifying. We let our voice, the, 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 the difficulty of letting our voices rest there for a minute, instead of doing the thing we want to do, which is, but it really actually is going on like you're just a plane taking off. Because what we find in those moments, in those terrible pauses of reality, is the overwhelming cultural scripts that we're being wrapped into, in which we are designed then at this moment, conditioned into saying something positive. And this cultural framework is everywhere from the secret to think and grow rich to, I mean, you really can play the game I love to play, which is please go to Target and play the game, which one of these things is not secretly, and you'll now have the language, new thought, mental magic. You, there will always be a blonde woman with a book that says, the universe has your back. <laughs> At any moment in history, it's like a Back to the Future episode where it always comes back to that one moment. But the bottom line is this unbelievably high anthropology that has become part and parcel of our culture begins then to deify and ritualize our own hungers, but then promise us our own salvation. So next time, and just as a fun little experiment, you say something honest or you overhear a conversation and just listen to the responses that you get. Well, let's not be negative. Well, let's just think about your mindset. Or more causal, spiritually causal, don't put that out into the universe. Well, I'm believing God for. Very instrumentalist language. We feel the cultural weight of these prohibitions against negative speech and the depth of our American cultural belief in the power of the mind. And what makes it so complicated for us right now in attempting to grapple with our befores and afters is it makes it almost impossible for us to count the cost of what has been taken. In all the talk for reframing and mindset, so I uh, spent my 20s running around. No one asked me to do this, but I interviewed televangelists and I attended a million megachurches with like eagles, eagles loosed and frying, flying freely. <laughs> the problem is the glass. The problem mostly is the glass in there's always a moment that goes so badly. But um, I spent my 20s uh, visiting megachurches, interviewing televangelists, and attending um, healing rallies, uh, miracle rallies. I have spent so long sitting with those whose insistence that God can do a miracle devolves into the fear that God must or else everything is impossible. Fear of their own failure, fear of their own shame, fear of a God who then doesn't seem quite so good or so loving. We are many things, right? We are minds and bodies and spirits and healthcare plans and experiences of racial and social inequality and the neighborhoods we live in and our family systems. We are not simply mental machines but this is the great American magic trick, the way we transform tragedy into failure. I love the fact that this, that ministry, that the church, that we get to be loving harbingers of a truth that is hard to hear, which is that most wishes, even good ones, don't come true. It's not fatalism, it's just the world as it is, that bodies age, diseases strike, love slips out of our hands, and we are human again today. So I think that helping people lovingly set aside the burden of positivity and the burden of perfectibility are two of the great gifts that we can give others right now in a culture inundated with an obsession with good, better, best. 
But sometimes we just need to live now, serve now, get up tomorrow, do our best now. And if we stop expecting our minds to solve our problems, we can free ourselves to start living alongside the things that we can't change. You're giving back people language, loving language of honesty and nuance that you're just not going to find in the greeting card aisle. The other great theologizer of our culture. <laughs> There's a beautiful term for what we have when we do this. And we don't talk about it a lot, but we feel it, and it's precarity. Right? Isn't that such a lovely? It's from that Latin precarious, right? Given as a favor, contingent, that which can be given and then taken away. I love that it helps us name a thing we know in our bones, that we are all a single anything away, right? Pandemic away, accident away, loss away, from losing things we can't get back. Uh, Dorothy Day, I wish uh, Dr. Carter was still here because he is writing a lovely book right now, includes a lot of Dorothy Day, but she's, of course, the wonderful Catholic anti-poverty activist you know so well. But she said a lovely thing about precarity. In our culture of autonomy and invincibility, she described precarity not as the problem. So right now, I imagine if you ask people what they want to do with their post-pandemic lives, they want to get back to before. Right? They want, they, want, they want that redo. They want that repeat. They want that full circle reboot moment. And instead, we get to offer a Christian language of precarity and contingency. That the terrible, beautiful truth of all this is that our precarity is not a thing that we will ever overcome, but that God is constantly calling us toward an uncomfortable, awful interdependence that precarity makes necessary. That we love to kind of imagine that we are, our lives are durable, and we do this with, we do this with all kinds of things, with the parts we play, with our roles, with our jobs, that we imagine, I am a, and I work at, and my job is. We love to imagine consistency. But so often, if we look back, especially on the chapters of our life, our lives are marked much more by change than they are about any kind of ongoingness. So how then do we talk about the lives we have, the days we have, where life is a chronic condition? Uh, sometimes I feel sort of theologically like the best summaries would be something more like the, the Princess Bride. Do you remember that movie? <laughs> the Dread Pirate Robert. Life is pain, highness. And anyone who says otherwise is selling something, <laughs> which is always in the back of my mind at Target. Because <laughs> we are practicing acting with the knowledge that things come undone, that they unspool. So sometimes I find it useful then to imagine precarity and seasons like this as, as running much more along the lines of a spectrum than in a, in a before and an after. So for instance, precarity might be where we are on a scale, but in a season, say, of invincibility on one side and, uh, and fragility on another. So let's say we are in a, in a complicated moment of transition Maybe our churches, maybe our families, maybe our, and we're just imagining, well, if I just, if I just get that kid launched, if I just get my mom care, if I just, if I just, right? Depending on where we are in that season, we might imagine a little more grace for ourselves if we know how much in the, over the course of a day and a year, we move back and forth between invincibility and shocking and horrifying fragility. I am, um, in the very first year of my diagnosis, we didn't think, it was September, and we didn't think I would make it till June. And I, I knew I didn't know how to do that, right? Is because we imagine our ongoingness as such a key feature of how we know how to be brave. So I thought, well, how do you live in precarity 
And is there a trick, maybe? Wouldn't that be nice? Is there a life hack? Um, <laughs> turns out there is not. Um, but I asked, I have this uh, lovely old uh, wizened psychologist where you can always tell he's from Arizona because there's tapestries everywhere. <laughs> this, I'm so confused. But um, I said, uh, I'm trying to make peace with precarity, but I don't, but I don't know how. And uh, he gave me some advice that he said he took from hikers of the Appalachian Trail. I live not far from one of the long arms of the Appalachian Trail, and I've only known a couple long haul hikers. But if you know any, I'd be very curious what they say about this. And Peter said that if they have to walk, I don't know, it's something like 2,000 miles of very daunting terrain, moving ahead into the unknown, with that much precarity, he said, what they do, what they typically do, is a and someone setting out will overpack. The tarp, the fleece hoodie, the 12 million granola bars. <laughs> that in moving into an unknown season, that the temptation then is to overprepare. But you set out on your journey, he says, but already the hiker is starting to flag. So the first stop he said, is the most important one. That pe people are waiting there to ask, is there anything you can set down? Is there anything? The extra frying pan, the 12th hoodie. And so he said, you're setting out on something unknown. This will be a long journey. Is there anything that you can set down? So my loves, as you move into a season where you are caring and caring for so many who are nervous about moving into a season of unknown, where they have to assimilate a person they were into a life after, I think we can ask gently if people might set down some of the burden of positivity, some of the burden of exhausting perfectibility, if we might encourage them that transformation will always be ahead, love will always be around them, but that they will never, unfortunately, ever reach for more than a life that is good enough. So before um, we live our little lives, I, um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am that you love and serve others in a culture that demands more than the gospel requires. And that you are agents of love and perpetual hope that the story of interdependence is ours. We were never going to do this on our own. That we are here, unfortunately, to carry one another. And that we will never set down. So, my darlings, thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Bless you.